This is Andy Burrow for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. And I'm joined by Joe Gallagher over Zoom for the first time in 2021. Joe, how are you? Good morning. Yeah, hi, good morning. Happy Valentine's to you, Andy. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> yeah, I can see all them cards and hear that letterbox going to yours there, mate. <laughs> um, Joe, how, how are you? How's life? How are things ticking over in the gym? Yeah, sound. Listen, we've a great start to the year. Gym's in, uh, everyone's in the gym. Uh, Paul Butler, Callum Johnson, Natasha Jonas, uh, Marcus Morrison, Sam Hyde, all in, all training and uh, yeah, real good energy and uh, yeah, no, really looking forward to uh, being involved in uh, some big fights this year. Now, of course, we will touch on all of the guys um, and obviously Tasha very shortly, but let's just go back to last night, the return of boxing in the UK for the first time this year. A lot to kind of discuss. Start off with the main event, Josh Warrington's shock and stunning loss to Maurizio Lara. Just for your thoughts on the fight, Joe? Um, yeah, listen, I was uh, I was gutted for Josh and his dad and the and the whole team. Um, obviously, lockdown. I, I put out on social media. Lockdown boxing is totally different to normal boxing. And I've hinted that a few times when fighters are used to performing before a crowd, but the crowd brings that little bit more out of them. I've stated it in the past, Ricky Hatton was a crowd fighter, Anthony Crawler was a crowd fighter. I think now AJ, as you see in there before Christmas, had some type of crowd. Josh Warrington, that's always fed off that crowd um, and that buzz um, and that roar. Um, it wasn't there last night. And when you don't have that, and your opponents don't have to deal with that swell of noise and constant pressure. Um, the, 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 it's just a, a straight shootout between the two of them. Um, Lara, good fighter, uh, fought five times since uh, Josh Warrington's last fight, four times last year, uh, and took the opportunity. Uh, there was lots of stick because they got him in the, in the rankings, but he, he proved his worth last night. Um, Josh Warrington... Like I say, a commentary was saying he, he, he didn't start his best what he was used to. And like I say, we've been out of it for a while and you're not used to surrounds. It's like it's like a sparring situation without head guard and gloves on. And uh, you can hear everything in, in, in that studio, in that arena. And uh, listen, good shot by Lara. Um, and I don't think Josh really recovered from there or any. He had good success. He, he came out, he tried. And at one point, I think it was around seven or eight, it was just a battle of wills. They both just stood there saying, I hit you, you hit me first to go. And uh, he, he, the, the, the rhythm of Lara uh, and the, the, the selection of shots, um, Josh wasn't used to. And um, like you say, he, he caught Josh with a, a lovely overhand right, stunned him, three or four left hooks. Then came with a right hook, body, left hook, head finishing shot. And um, I felt so sorry for Josh Warren. What a terrible last few weeks he's advocating the belt, um, fighting behind closed doors, losing. And, and for Lara, what a, a great start for 2021. His team uh, have come over, um, got the opportunity. Um, whoever taught Deddy into most probably thinking this would be a touch for Josh Warrington is most probably um, having a little giggle to themselves there now. And uh, they should feel hard done by that. that They're not on the plane flying home with an IBF world title and, and being a world champion. Joe, after after the first knockdown last night, a lot of people certainly have social media seem to think that before it should have been stopped there and then the referee should have either waved it off or uh, Josh's corner should have stepped in just to pull him out. Just your thoughts. Do you think Joe? Joe do you think Josh should have been pulled out um, sooner? It's a very hard call. Um, the referee, and like you say, you've got to give the champions every chance. They're the champion, they're the chance. And it, 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 was, it was, people could say he was saved by the bell that round, but he came out and he, he tried to give it a go. You look at Frotch Groves that time, Frotch was allowed the benefit of the doubt and he came back and, and he beat Groves. Um, the champion always has given him every opportunity. And I, I know he wasn't the champion in the fight, but Josh Warrington, like you say, was on his feet. Howard Foster most really looked at him, he gave the right. Uh, thing and he survived. He survived the round. It wasn't that he, he fell to the floor. He survived. Went back to the corner, and uh, we've seen that in boxing time and time again. Fighters could have been stopped 
but come back. Then you've got to look at Gatti and Ward. Gatti was absolutely cr- doubled over with a body shot, come back and then came out and put it on Ward the next round. So that's what boxing is. And uh, I think Howard Foster uh, did the right thing and gave Josh Warrington every opportunity. In your eyes, Joe, how big of an upset was that for British boxing? Where where does that rank? Um, I, I don't think it's a huge upset as what people are, are, are talking about. I, I think if you, I think if you're looking at Lara's record, obviously there was no big names on it. There was no one that he'd ever beaten before. But he's 22 years of age. He's uh, ha- had fights. He's learned his trade. He's learned on the job, and he's got an opportunity. And he's been kept fighting regular and often it said in commentary he'd been sparring world champions world champions wouldn't be sparring if they didn't give him any good they said he was heavy handed and he was 22 year old with lots of ambition um, I will not say it's a huge upset that people are making out I just thought we, we got to a kid over who was hungry who was ambitious and uh, he took his opportunity Josh Warrington will people say that it, it, it wasn't Josh Warrington well, you can't say that. Josh had said he trained well, he prepared well. It was supposed to be a defence of his world title. Like I said to you, it's just different surrounds and different backgrounds. And you don't know until you get in that ring that night how you're going to perform and that ring walk. And you're seeing for the AJ fight in December, the lengths that Sky and Matchroom went to make that a crowd. They had what the song they sing, Caroline being played out, they have the crowd noise being played out, they have some type of crowd to try and make it as much as a crowd possible for Anthony Joshua. Um, and he came through that uh, Pulev fight, but Pulev came over, didn't really have 80,000 down his neck, but was still more resilient. And uh, that's what happened with, with, with uh, there last night. I, I think for the elite fighters in the country, this, who really like the crowd and feed off the crowd, that when they land a good shot, there's that roar of a crowd, you feel the walls coming in. The opponents don't have that now, so it's more of a, a level playing field. Final thing on the, the main event, uh, Joe, a few people have social media suggesting it may be time for Josh to consider retirement. Obviously, he's had some, some tough fights over the years and last night would have been just as tolling as any of them on his body. Um, but looking at kind of I don't really want to say a rebuild job, but it will take him a bit of time to kind of get back into the, the top elite contention at least. Do you think this might be something that Josh would have to consider now stepping away from the sport? Um, I, I think it's never do anything too hasty on a loss, go away, recuperate. Like I say, being out of the ring for a while, um, I did say in the gymnasium um, this week, I thought. Maybe what might have happened is Josh won last night and moved up to super featherweight and then went and chased Frampton. If Frampton beats uh, Herring at the end of the month and did a rematch there at super featherweight, maybe he may have to, to move up in weight. Um, but only him, his team, no. Um, Josh Warrington, like you say, one bad night at the office doesn't make you a bad fighter. He's got a great team around him. His dad knows him best. And... Um, yeah, I don't think Josh Warrington will retire. I think he, he'll want to come back and, and put that right, whether that'll be at 130 or 130 or 126. Moving on to one of the fight on the card, Joe, one which caused a lot of controversy. The Zelfa Barrett Kiko Martinez fight, Zelfa Barrett coming away with a unanimous decision win. Controversial to say the least, the judges' scorecards coming in for a lot of criticism. Uh, once again, it seems to be a recurring theme now with, with British boxing. Just your thoughts on the cards? I thought the fight on the night, I texted it to a few people. I had it a draw. It could have gone one round to Kiko. That's how, how close a fight it was. The scorecards didn't reflect that. Um, I uh, find that hard. But the other side of me is. is we're all quick to jump up and down. Oh, that's shocking, that's shocking. But when we go and fight in America, there's no jumping up and down. That's just like, that's just the norm. If you're English and you're fighting America, you've got to win and win well. I've had fighters in the past perform in America. Stephen Smith versus Pedraza, the scorecards didn't half no, nowhere reflect the good work Stephen Smith did in that fight. Well, the dish out, 118s, 110s, and you just have to, oh yeah, you get on with it. So then it's it's not, we're looking after ourselves a little bit and it's fair play, but it's not that it goes in. Jose Burton fought in Latvia, 
against Bolotniks. The scorecards were absolutely ridiculous when everyone had Burton 4 1 up after 5 6 and handed in a clean shutout scorecards. So it isn't that it just goes on in England, it does go on in Latvia, it does go on in Germany, it does go on in Italy, it does go on in America. It's, it's, a, it's a worldwide universal problem that the governing bodies need to pull people in or sanction bodies and ask them to explain them scorecards or we can't eradicate it. I feel sorry for Kiko Martinez. I thought he put a great performance in. It was his last chance at the saloon. He came in and I'm surprised Kiko was still boxing when I heard the fight was made because it was like six years ago when he fought quick. Um, and since then he's fought Cruz, Gary Russell, um, but fair play to him, he put a performance in and I thought it was a great learning fight for Zelfa Barrett. Um, as always, there's talk of a rematch straight away. Will we see it? Well, we've heard what people say about rematches in the past. Everyone's still waiting and Jonas Harper and that's not happened. So we'll see if that happens. Um, but I think it was a good learning fight for Zelfa. And I think um, the judging, I think that's a, a universal thing. I think governing bodies or uh, associations or the British Boxing Board of Control have to ask the judges to explain them scorecards. But it's very easy for people to sit at home. They have all the cameras and all the angles. They have all the cameras and all the angles. When you're sat on one side of a ring all night, you only see that side of it and that's your judging. And this is not an excuse. I'm sure Terry O'Connor, I was expecting a tweet for Terry last night coming out going, it wasn't me um, because he wasn't involved in it last night. Terry O'Connor, he usually gets a slack. But I feel we're too quick to jump on our own. But in America, no one really jumps on their scorecards when we're always on the wrong end of decisions or like Jose Burton and Latvia. So it's not crying over spilt milk, but it's just industry standard now. So it is no surprise. And Zelfa Barrett won and that was it. And if that fight was in Spain last night, Kiko Martinez most probably won on the scorecards reversed 118, 111. Joe, just moving away from that, touching on to the fighters in your gym. Obviously, you mentioned Tasha Jonas earlier on. Uh, Tasha and Callum Johnson, certainly two names who continue to get mentioned by, by fans of the sport who would love to see them back in the ring. What's kind of the plans with Tasha at the minute? Hey, listen, Tasha's in the gym. She's training. She's always what the Terry Harper rematch to talk about it. Um, obviously, when you have a fight that was one of the fights of the year in boxing news, the Ring Magazine Female Fight of the Year promised a rematch, but then Sky don't talk about it, won't entertain it, ignore it. Eddie Hearn can make rematches for all types of fights. Dylan White Povetkin, when he got knocked out in five, we can't make the rematch for Terry Harper and Natasha Jonas. Listen, it is what it is. Everyone knows up and down the country, they can kid themselves, but Natasha Jonas is the WBC world champion. And... She's in the gym, she's training, and we're looking at most probably um, a big fight um, coming up now in the springtime. And um, yeah, and that's it. With Natasha, she says, can't hang around and sit around and wait until Terry Harper and all them waiting on Natasha getting old overnight. Natasha's been there, dealt with that, won that. She's the world champion. Everyone's seen it, she's the world champion, and she's going up now and going to uh, carry, carry on now and go after the people in, in the weight divisions above her. Callum Johnson, again, just like I say, another man who everybody's excited to see back in the ring. I saw Eddie put, so, uh, put something out, I did an interview, saying that he'd like to try and make the Bawatsi fight in the summer. Um, have you had any kind of initial conversations about that at all? No, no, only the uh, offer last year, which was a dismal offer for a three-fight deal for Callum Johnson. And uh, no, no, nothing more for that. Callum Johnson's in the gym, he's training. There's lots of action in the light heavyweight division. Um, domestically and worldwide at the moment and Callum Johnson's got to be in the gym and be prepared that if anything happens he can step in uh, on short notice and uh, take a, an opportunity there's nobody out there who's got to give Callum Johnson 10 weeks training camp 12 weeks and like you say Eddie said about Boatsy there they've had plenty of opportunity to make Boatsy Callum Johnson a fight I'd like to see is Boatsy Craig Richards I think that's a brilliant fight I think that's a great London fight great beef fight I think Boatsy Craig Richards, I know Antiard's been beat now, but for a London fight, domestically wise, I think Boatsy Craig Richards is a, is a big fight. Moving forward once again, uh, spoke to Paul Butler the other day, Joe. Paul said that he's closing in on the final eliminator. I haven't had anything announced yet. Have you kind of got any update for us? 
no pulse in the gym training, um, improving, and uh, really, really pleased and impressed with Paul's attitude in training um, since we've come back this year. His, uh, his mindset, his um, dedication, and his learning is improving. Uh, I'm really happy with his mindset uh, coming back in 2021, but uh, nothing to update on that. He said he'd be open to facing uh, Carrier 5 when I asked him. Would that's that be a point? That's that's not Andy, that's Andy, Andy, let's shut that down now. That's not happening. May I ask why? I, I, I understand why people want or anything else, but Calia 5 invite isn't happening. Never will, never will happen. They've had plenty of opportunities to make fights for Paul Butler. He moved from Frank Warren to Matchroom to fight the McDonald's and then fights never materialised. That Calia 5, Paul Butler fight will never happen. Fair enough, Joe. Um, just moving forward to Sky and Jose, but um, what's Jose's plans for this year, Joe? Jose, listen, he's in the gym. It'd be interesting to see now if the British Boxing Board of Control bring in this new weight division, which is the WBC have, uh, which is, is it the, the bridge weight or whatever it's called? And the, yeah, and they've realigned the, the cruiserweight division. I'm just waiting to see whether the British Boxing Board of Control bring that weight division in, because I do feel fighters like Jose Burton, and Stephen Ward, for example, making that light heavyweight was too much for them. But the jump from 12-7 to 14-4 cruiserweight is too big for them. That weight division in the middle of the 13s is bang on for them type of fighters. Enzo Macanelli was an ideal example of somebody who would have benefited from between cruise and light heavyweight. That would have been his natural weight. So it'd be interesting you now if the British Board of Control bring that weight division in here. And I think it would uh, definitely uh, help a lot of fighters. Is that where you can see maybe Jose's career progressing then towards that division if he was brought in over here? Yeah, de de no, definitely, I, I do feel. Um, like I say, he's been light heavyweight for a long time now, and I think there, there's an, an ideal opportunity there for a weight division. He's growing the size of him. I've always said he'd be a late bloomer, and he is. He's physically growing out. The legs on him are getting bigger, the shoulders, the back on him, and he's physically developing into a man now. And, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, that 14-4, obviously, he spars Sam Hyde in the gymnasium, and he spars plenty of cruiserweights in the past and done very well with them. But uh, I, I do feel it's a big step because um, them 14-4 guys, they're coming down from 16 stone and uh, that, that, that's a big difference. So I'd really like the British Boxing Board of Control now to bring this new weight division in between uh, cruiserweight and light heavyweight. You mentioned Sam Hoyd there, Joe. Uh, it's been a while since we saw him in the ring, uh, obviously last time out, but defeat to Dion Juma. What's, what is Sam currently up to? Does, does he kind of well, do, does he still have that same kind of desire to, to push on with his career or has he kind of put it to the side with a pandemic? I know Sam's, um, yeah, Sam's busy. He's got work. He's got his gym uh, that he's doing very well with business-wise. He's doing Zoom classes and everything else. And uh, he's in the gym. He's ticking over once, twice a week. He's training. He's getting back in. And uh, first and foremost, he's got uh, mouths to feed. He's got a gymnasium to run and, that takes priority and I think you see a lot of fighters have obviously can't train full-time professionals have got to go out and get a work whether it's working delivering for Amazon or whatever and um, that, that they that they have to go and uh, feed and that's the main thing for, for Sam Hyde that's what he's got got to do and uh, but he's in the gym he's training and hopefully when the restrictions and everything's eased up a little bit um, hopefully he'll be ready to fight in the spring Joe, you've also got Alex Del Magani who you haven't had the chance to be in his corner for yet. What is the likelihood of seeing Alex out anytime soon? Yeah, I think uh, Mick Hennessy's got a date coming up um, and there's talk of uh, Alex fighting on that. Um, Alex is in the gym. Obviously, he went home at Christmas to look after his family and that. Um, he's up here training very well. Um, Crawler's doing uh, some really good work with him. And, um, yeah, no, Alex is just looking, waiting for, for confirmation on that day. He's a very dedicated kid, studies and breathes the game. And, uh, yeah, no, we're, um, we're, we're excited with, to have Alex in the gymnasium. And, uh, like I said, there was really good quality sparring sessions last week with Paul Butler. And then just a final name. Oh, right, it was a couple more, rather. you got Marcus Morrison looking at middleweight. It was a, obviously, you've got the Bentley Cash fight for that British and Commonwealth title fight uh, coming up. But just where's kind of Marcus's head at? No, no, Marcus. Listen, we're, we're just waiting to get a date for Marcus. Um, obviously, we're, we're expecting to see that fight. I think that's a great fight, Bentley v Cash. I'm really pleased that's going ahead. I'll be disappointed if that 
gets pulled one way or the other because I think that's a real great fight. It's back to the days when you you're Wayne Alexander's and your Takalu's for and that and I think that's a, a real good fight, real exciting time for that division. Um, Marcus there now obviously we're just waiting a date. There's talk of him fighting Brian Rose, which I think is a good fight. Um, and most probably as an eliminator, the winner then to fight the uh, winner of Cash and Bentley. Um, so yeah, we're just like I say, we're just waiting now. It's very hard because we're trying to push forward, but we've got our hands tied behind our back because we can go and book venues, book shows, go to do everything, and then the British Border Control go no boxing. Boris comes out, another lockdown. So it's very hard at the moment for for, for them type of fighters. But boxing at the moment is very. It's like middle management and business is either the elite are working, which your Joshua's, your Josh Taylor's, your Josh Warrington's, or the prospects coming through because they're cheap. But the middle management fighters, your Liam Smith, your Callum Johnson's, them type of fighters, they're expensive to put out. So it's very hard for them to get the work without a crowd or tickets or whatever. So it's hard for them. There's a lot of them treading water at the moment. Final man I want to touch on in the gym, who I imagine he's, he hasn't actually been back in yet. He's Callum Smith. Joe, how is Callum, obviously, after the defeat to Canelo at the end of last year? Yeah, no, listen, Callum's um, after the fight. I've done a few texts back and forth with him. Just leave him alone. This is his time now. He's uh, enjoying family time. And um, well, I've I seen an interview there that he did that he intends to carry on. Um, so we'll just have to, to wait and see. Time's a great healer. We're in a pandemic. Um, light heavyweight division is a, an active division. Some big hitters in there, and it, it's packed full of talent. Um, I see someone mentioned Boatse, but you can't go from ring magazine champions come back down to fight in domestic level at light heavyweight. Do you know what I mean? Callum Smith should come back and go straight into a Gilberto Ramirez type of fight at light heavyweight. I'd like to see that type of fight for him if he's got to continue at light heavyweight. Um, yeah, that's the type of fight I'd like for Callum Smith. And I think it's something that I'd get him motivated. But listen, I'm leaving Callum to have time by himself, do what he wants to do. If he wants to carry on boxing, great. If he wants to retire, great. He'll have me back in whatever he chooses to do. It's uh, just time for him to sit back, relax and enjoy a bit of family time. I mean, Joe, on the back of the loss, what did you think seemed to be most likely at the time? You know, Callum's achieved so much in the sport, as you say, who was the number one at super middleweight for a, a prolonged period of time, for a couple of years. Um, would, would you have been happy to see him just step away or did you always feel like there was just so much more he had to offer? Um, I think... Um... Lockdown's been a killer because I feel Callum, when he's on a run of form and he gets better and better, um, when he fought in New York, we did suggest at the time about moving up to light heavyweight, um, but people were saying, no, we can still make the weight and do everything. So we went through the rider fight. And for me, then the alarm bells were there really then for like, well, we can make the weight, but can we perform at it anymore? Do you understand? So that was that thing. And then all of a sudden the Canelo carrot got dangled. So he's the man that's got to give you the biggest purse in boxing. And that was a fight that we would have liked. I'm not making excuses, a proper 10 week camp for. We would like to have got the proper sparring partners in for, but you can't fly them in. And you've seen that with Josh Warrington last night. Canelo said in an interview, he knew for four months he was fighting Callum Smith. Um, so it is what it is. Callum Smith went in there, gave the best that he could do. And like I said at the time, it was Callum's decision to go, let's go for it four and a half weeks out. So he understood the, the, the risk involved. He understood what was involved. He understood the, the, the lack of preparation that was involved. He understood the problem with the sparring partners. He made that decision. We went into it the best that we could do and he quit himself the best that he could do. Was that the best Cam Smith in there? No, it wasn't. But it isn't going to be in them terms, in this pandemic, in them conditions. So it is what it is. Fair play to Canelo. He's a great fighter. Um, Callum Smith, does he want to continue in boxing? That's down to him. He said he does. Um, and that's great. Um, is his desire there to be a two-weight world champion? Well, like I say, there, there's some big fighters there in that division. b 2 bf Bivol, um, Joe Smith. It's a shame that fight didn't happen last night. It's a tough division. Um, and like you say, he's got to have a rest. And sometimes pe sometimes you can have people in and around you that want you to carry on. But they want you to carry on, not for their sake, for your sake, but for their sake. In my world, for Callum Smith's world, 
Callum's done what he's set out to do. When me and Callum turned pro, I said to Callum, we're going to do what Naz did. We've got to get in, win the titles, earn your money and get out. I feel Callum Smith's done that now. Callum Smith now wants to continue in boxing and go to be a two-weight world champion. Well, I'll support him in that and I'll coach him and we'll move on and we'll try and achieve that goal. But for me as a fighter, as a coach and a manager, to turn around to Callum Smith and bring him back and go, there you are, Mrs. Smith and Mr. Smith. There's your son back, set up for life, achieved everything in boxer, job done, go and enjoy your retirement. I have no problem with that neither. So Callum's got to think long and hard. And if that will and desire is still there, then come back. It's all right coming back and then being, but there's nothing worse. And you have to take advice from people who have most probably retired four or five weeks in and going, Joe, what? can't be asked for this no more. That's when it sinks in. You think, fucking hell, why did he agree to this? I knew ages ago I didn't want to do this. And Crawler, for his last fight, he trained and he looked brilliant, but when he got in the ring, he just didn't have it. Ricky Hatton's most probably last fight, trained and did everything else, most didn't have it. But Callum doesn't have them miles on the clock. What he just needs now is time, be honest with himself and his family, and decide, nah, I'm, I'm going to go and do it. And if that's what he wants to do, then great. Um, but all Callum Smith, that's what I'm saying, I've not spoke to him, just let him be and uh, let him enjoy. I have no influence, just let him make a decision on his own, not to be influenced by himself, just be honest with himself. Joe, you talked about kind of a weight earlier on in your answer there. Um, do you think if a Canelo fight wasn't spoken about, it's been, it was well, it's talked about for well over a year before it was actually agreed. Um, it was always kind of mentioned. Do you think if when that first fight, when that fight was not, when that fight was first mentioned, if it hadn't have been, we might have seen Callum move up sooner. Yeah, I, I, I've always suggested to, to, to Callum the time to move up, time to move up, time to move up. Longer you keep yourself at one six eight, what you've achieved will get lower, lesser and lesser. The time was to to, to move up. But I'm not sat here making sure everyone's clever in hindsight. There's plenty of people around. And everyone knows that I was always. Let's go, let's move up, let's move up. When Gilberto Ramirez moved up last year, let's move up and go and fight him for the WBO world title. Um, so, yeah, like you say, you can make one. Seat. And this is what we've got to understand with fighters. It's like Josh Warrington now, much more like Zelfa Barrett last night. It's all right making weight, but it's performing at the weight. And there's a point in time you have to move up. Scott Quigg, Carl Frampton, they both made weight for their fight. But we didn't see the best Carl Frampton, we didn't see the best Scott Quigg. That fight would have been better at featherweight, do you understand? And uh, the, the fight is there, the, the need to, to, to move up. There's a time in your life, you need to, Jose Burton needs to move up now. Liam Smith was always campaigning at well at weight. Then he was 154 for ages. His last two, three fights have been 160. You've seen Liam Williams move up. There's a time, Brian Rose, you, there's a time when you've got to go, I can't do this, I can make it, but it's just not me. And you see that in the performances and... Uh, and I honestly believe Callum Smith now it's time for him to move up. Most probably, if we did see Callum return to Rinjo, you're talking maybe two, possibly even three fights till he gets a chance to to fight for one version of a world title. And in the middle of a pandemic, it won't be easy to get those fights. It could potentially be another couple of years. Is that something that kind of you think you yourself and Callum really need to kind of have a conversation about with regards to how long it may be until he gets a chance to if he wants to become a two-weight world champion? No, I don't think um, Callum really would have to wait two or three fights. I think when you've been a world champion, the Ring Magazine champion at a low weight division, moving up a weight division should automatically put you up there and give you high rankings. I think what Callum Smith had won is mostly one fight at one light, at light heavyweight. And then we're in for the world title fight. I don't think there's a case of two or three. If it was going to be two or three, I'd want him to be active. And it's great to see Canelo going old school and fighting and being active. And that's what fighters need to be, be active. So Canelo now is talking about five fights within 12 months. That's that's nothing different than what you go and look at Barry McGuigan's resume. Look at his resume coming through, how often he was fighting, all the old fighters were, your Leonard uh, uh, Durans, Chavez's. That's that's how it is. And if Calum Smith does come back and fight, say May, then let's let him fight in May. Let's let him fight at the end of July. Let's let him fight at the end of September, October. If you've got to do two, three fights like that, let's make sure the three fights 
within an eight month period, bang, bang, bang. And, um, and then we're ready for world time. It's no point to fight and then another six months because you're losing momentum. You understand? You're fighting, you're coming away. Um, but no, I think Callum Smith's won fight and he's in for a world title. But that's yeah, down to him. That's down to him. This is the first time I've talked about it. And most most of when Callum hears this, the first time in the same way I heard his interview, but it's uh, Callum's just got to, I want him to be switched off from boxing and just to not talk boxing and just enjoy family time. He's He's got a... Uh, a great little family there now and it's great to see him evolving as a man with a parent uh, and his partner and uh, yeah it, boxing as people say it, it's not it's not the the fighting and the training of each other it's the politics of it and that was a long year last year of being a tent of hooks and most probably fighting Canelo in May oh no we're not it could be September oh no it's got to be December that's a long year mentally draining so I don't want Callum to be talking or thinking boxing, just clear off. And when you feel you've got that itch and that hungry, you, you'll know, you'll know, you know, spend enough time outside of the ring. You know, if you want to carry it on, when, and it's when you want to carry it on, not because other people want you to carry on. It's you so at the end of the day. Final thing before I let you go, next weekend, one final thought I wanted to try. Josh Kelly, David Avenesian, everybody got everything crossed. We finally get to see that one. Your thoughts, provided everything does go to plan and we see them in the ring finally. No, I think it's um, I think it's a great fight, a great 50-50 fight. I think if the fight had happened when it was supposed to happen to the first time, second time, most would we give it um, Evanson, uh, most would be the winner, most would we won the fights. I feel the time it hasn't. It's mentally brought Everson up and brought him down again, brought him up, brought him down again, brought him up now where Josh Keller was there, but hasn't really fought that much. I think the last time he fought was out in Arizona or wherever, but it's allowed any niggles, any injuries, everything healed. Now, this is Josh Kelly's first, I'd say first, proper real big push for this fight, full of energy, full of enthusiasm. Adam Boo back in the gym, recovered with his knee up, being there on it there now, doing the pads, Everything, timing, everything's about timing. I think this has got to be a good fight. Can Josh Kelly keep him off for the full 12 rounds? I think his shot selection and his cuteness will be very good early on. But can he do it for the 12? Can his hands hold up for the 12 rounds? Evanson, he's a man demented. He's not going to stop coming and coming and coming. And I just hope we're not talking next Sunday about scorecards again. And if the right man wins, the right man's given the result. Right, Joe, we will leave that there now. I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of your Sunday. I appreciate your time as always, mate. Stay safe. And hopefully I can come up to the gym and see you all soon, if not at a fight. Thanks for being to Boxing Social. Cheers, Andy. Thank you, mate.